Before I co-founded the Provincetown Players in Massachusetts, I worked as a newspaper reporter out in Iowa where I grew up. Once I was sent downstate to cover a murder trial, a woman who had been accused of murdering her husband, a crime no one could understand, not even myself. As part of my story, I visited this woman's kitchen and I never forgot what I saw there, how that woman's kitchen opened my eyes. This is Trifles, a one act play inspired by these real events. Fictionalized, yes, but not altogether unlikely. The scene is the kitchen of the now abandoned farmhouse of John Wright, a gloomy kitchen, and left without having been put in order. Unwashed pans under the sink, a loaf of bread outside the bread box, a dish towel on the table, other signs of incompleted work. At the rear, the outer door opens and the sheriff comes in, followed by the county attorney and Hale. All are much bundled up and head straight to the stove. They are followed by the two women, Mrs. Peters, the sheriff's wife, and Mrs. Hale. The women stand close together near the door. Ah, this feels good. Come up to the fire, ladies. I'm not cold. Okay, uh, now, uh, Mr. Hale, before we uh, move things about, you explain to Mr. Henderson just what you saw when you came here yesterday morning. Okay. By the way, has anything been moved? Are things just as you left them yesterday? Uh, no, it's, uh, it's just about the same. Oh, well, when it uh, dropped below zero last night, I thought I'd better send Frank out this morning to make a fire for us. No use getting pneumonia with a big case on. <laughs> uh, but I told him not to touch anything except the stove. And uh, you know Frank. Uh, somebody should have been left here yesterday. Oh, yesterday. Uh, well, uh, you know, when I had to send Frank out to, uh, to Morris Center for that man who, uh, he, he went crazy. I, I want you to know that, uh, you know what? I had my hands full yesterday, uh, but I knew that you could get back from Omaha by today. And uh, as long as I went over everything here myself. Well, Mr. Hale, tell just what happened when you came here yesterday morning. Well, Harry and I started into town with a load of potatoes. We came along the road from my place. And uh, when I got here, I said that uh, I think I was going to see if I can't get John Wright to go in with me on a party telephone. I spoke to Wright about it once before, but he kind of put me off saying that folks talk too much anyway. And all he asked was some peace and quiet. Peace and quiet. <laughs> I guess you know about how much he talked himself. But I thought that if I went to the house and spoke to it about it before his wife, although I did say to Harry that uh, that I didn't know is what his wife wanted made much difference to John anyway. Let's talk about that later, Mr. Hale. I do want to talk about that, but tell now just what happened when you got to the house. Well, I didn't, uh, I didn't hear nor see anything. Um, I knocked on the door and it was all quiet inside. I knew they must be up because it wasn't past eight o'clock. So I knocked again and I thought I heard somebody say, come in. I wasn't sure, not sure yet, but, uh, but I opened the door, th this door here, and there sitting in that rocker was Mrs. Wright. They all look at the rocker. What was she doing? Well, she was rocking back and forth. And, and she had an apron in her hand and she was, um, what's the word, pleating it. And how did she look? Well, she, she looked queer. How do you mean queer? Yes, how exactly do you mean queer? Yeah, well, I guess like, like she didn't know what she was gonna do next a and kind of done up. How did she seem to feel about your coming? No, I don't think, I don't think she minded one way or the other. She didn't pay much attention. I, I said, uh, how do, Miss Wright? It's cold, ain't it? And she said, is it? And just kind of went on pleating at her apron. Well, I was surprised that she didn't ask me to come up to the stove or to sit down, but she sat there, not even looking at me. So, so I said, I want to see John. And, and then she laughed. Huh. 
I guess you I guess you call it a laugh. Well, I thought of Harry and the team outside. So so I said a little sharp, can I see John? No, she says, kind of kind of dull like. Well, ain't he home? Says I. Oh yeah, says she. He's home. Well then why can't I see him? I asked her, out of patience. Because he's dead. Dead, says I. And she just she just nodded her head, not the least bit excited, but rocking back and forth, back and forth. Well, wh where is he, says I, not, not knowing what to say. And, and, and she just pointed upstairs like that. So, um, so I got up with the idea of going up there and I walked from there to here. And, and then I, I says to her, well, what did he die from? Well, he died of a rope around his neck, she says. Mm -hmm. Just went on pleating at the apron. <laughs> While I went out and called Harry, I thought I might need some help. So we went upstairs, and there he was lying, just dead on the door. I'd rather have you go into that upstairs where you can point it all out. Just go on now with the rest of the story. All right. Uh, well, my first thought was to get that rope off. Uh, it looked... Uh, hmm. Uh, uh, so Harry, he 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 went. Uh, oh no, he's dead. All right, we better not touch anything. And so then we went back downstairs. And she was still sitting the same way. Has anybody been notified? I I ask. No, she said, un unconcerned. Who did this, Mrs. Wright? Said Harry, and he said it businesslike. And she stopped pleating her of, of her apron. Well, I don't know, she says. You don't know, says Harry? No, says she. Well, weren't, weren't you sleeping in the bed with him, says Harry? Well, yeah, says she. But I was on the inside. Somebody slipped a rope around his neck and strangled him. And, and you didn't wake up, says Harry? I didn't wake up, she said right after him. Well, well we must have looked as if we didn't, didn't see how that could be. For, for after a minute, she said, uh, I sleep sound. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, well, so Harry was going to ask her more questions, but but I said, well, maybe we should first let her ask uh, about the coroner and the sheriff, say her to them. And and so so Harry, he went fast as he could to, to River's place where there's a telephone. And what did Mrs. Wright do when she knew that you had gone for the coroner? She moved from that chair there to that one over there. It points to a small chair in the corner. And she just, she sat there with her hands held together and looking down. Well, I got a feeling that I, that I ought to make some conversation. So, so I said that I had come in to see if John wanted to put in the telephone. And at that, she started to laugh. <laughs> and she looked right at me, scared. Well, I don't know. Maybe, 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 maybe it wasn't scared. No, I wouldn't like to say that it was. So um, soon Harry got back though, and and then Doctor Lloyd came, and and you, Mister Peters, and and so I guess that's uh, I guess that's about all that I know that you don't. Hmm. I I guess we'll we'll go upstairs first, and then out to the barn and around there. You're convinced that there was nothing important here, nothing that would point to any motive? Uh, you know, nothing here but uh, kitchen things. The county attorney, after again looking around the kitchen, opens the door of a cupboard closet. He gets up on a chair and looks on a shelf. He pulls his hand away, sticky. Oh, yeah, here's a nice mess. The women draw nearer to each other. Oh, her fruit. It did, it did freeze. She worried about that when it turned so cold. She said the fire would go out and her jars would break. <laughs> well, can you beat the women? Held for murder and worrying about her preserves. Jeez. I guess before we're through, she may have something more serious than preserves to worry about. <laughs> well, women are used to worrying over trifles. Yeah. The two women move a little closer together. And yet, for all their worries, what would we do without the ladies? 
The women do not unbend. The county attorney goes to the sink, takes a dipper full of water from the pail and pouring it into a basin, washes his hands. He starts to wipe them on the roller towel, turns it for a cleaner place. Oh, dirty towels. He kicks his foot against the pans under the sink. Oh, not much of a housekeeper, would you say, lady? There's a great deal of work to be done on a farm. To be sure, and yet... He gives her a little bow. I know there are some Dixon County farmhouses which do not have such roller towels. He gives it a pull to expose its length again. Well, those towels get dirty awful quick. Men's hands aren't always as clean as they might be. Ah, oh, loyal to your sex, I see. But you and Mrs. Wright were neighbors. I suppose you were friends, too. Um, I, I've not seen much of her of late years. I've not been in this house much more than a year. Hmm. Why was that? You didn't like her? I liked her well enough. Farmer's wives have their hands full, Mr. Henderson. And then... Yes? It never seemed a very cheerful place. No, it's not cheerful. I shouldn't say she had the homemaking instinct. Well, I don't know as Wright had, either. You mean that they didn't get on very well? No, I don't mean anything. But I don't think a place would be any cheerfuller for John Wright's being in it. I'd like to talk more of that a little later. I want to get the lay of things upstairs now. He goes to the left where three steps lead to a door. Uh, I suppose that uh, anything Mrs. Peters does will be all right. Uh, she was to take in some clothes for her and, uh, you know, a few little things. You know, we left in uh, such a hurry yesterday. Yes, but I would like to see what you take, Mrs. Peters, and keep an eye out for anything that might be of use to us. Yes, Mr. Henderson. The women listen to the men's steps on the stairs and then look about the kitchen. Oh, I'd hate to have men coming into my kitchen, snooping around and criticizing. She arranges the pans under the sink, which the attorney had shoved out of place. Of course, it's no more than their duty. Duty's all right. But I guess that deputy sheriff that came out to make the fire might have got a little of this on. She gives the roller towel a pull. Wish I'd thought of that sooner. Seems mean to talk about her not having things slicked up when she had to come away in such a hurry. Mrs. Peters goes to a small table in the left rear corner of the room and lifts one end of a towel that covers a pan. She had bread set. Mrs. Hale's eyes are fixed on a loaf of bread beside the bread box, which is on a low shelf at the other side of the room. She moves slowly toward it. She was going to put this in there. She picks up the loaf, then abruptly drops it. And in a manner of returning to familiar things. It's a shame about her fruit. I wonder if it's all gone. She gets up on the chair and looks. I, I, I think there's some here that's all right, Mrs. Peters. Yes, here. Well, this is cherries, too. I declare I believe that is the only one. With the bottle in her hand, she goes to the sink and wipes it off on the outside. Oh, she'll feel awful bad after all her hard work in the hot weather. I remember the afternoon I put my cherries last summer. She puts the bottle on the big kitchen table in the center of the room. The sigh is about to sit down in the rocking chair. Before she is seated, she realizes what chair it is. With a slow look at it, she steps back. The chair, which she has touched, rocks back and forth. Well, I must get those things from the front room closet. Mrs. Peters goes to the door at the right, but after looking in the other room, she steps back. You coming with me, Mrs. Hale? You could help me carry them. They go in the other room, reappear. Mrs. Peters carrying a dress and skirt, Mrs. Hale following with a pair of shoes. Why, it's cold in there. She puts the clothes on the big table and hurries to the stove. Mrs. Hale examines the skirt. Uh, Wright was always so cheap. Yeah, I think maybe that's why she kept so much to herself. 
She didn't even belong to the lady's aid. I, I suppose she felt that she couldn't do her part. And then you don't enjoy things when you feel shabby. She used to wear pretty clothes. Be lively when she was Minnie Foster, one of the town girls singing in the choir. But that, uh, that was 30 years ago. Uh, this all you was to take in? She said she wanted an apron. Funny thing to want, for there isn't much to get you dirty in jail, goodness knows. But I suppose to make her feel more natural. She said they was in the top drawer in, in this cupboard. Yes, here. And then her little shawl always hung behind the door. She opens the stair door and looks. Yes, here it is. She quickly shuts the door leading upstairs. Mrs. Peters. Yes, Mrs. Hale. Do you think she did it? Oh, I don't know. Well, I don't think she did. Asking for an apron and her little shawl, worrying about her fruit? Peters glances up where footsteps are heard in the room above. Peter says it looks, it looks bad for her. Mr. Henderson is awful sarcastic in his speech and he'll make fun of her saying she didn't wake up. Well, I guess John Wright didn't wake up when they were slipping that rope under his neck. No, it's strange. It must have been done awful crafty and still. They say it was such a funny way to kill a man, rigging it all up like that. Well, that's just what Mr. Hale said. There was a gun in the house. He says that's what he can't understand. Mr. Henderson said coming out that what was needed was a motive, something to show sudden anger or sudden feeling. Well, I, I don't see any signs of anger around here. Mrs. Hale puts her hand on the dish towel, which lies on the table. She stands looking down at the table, one half of which is clean, the other half is messy. It's what to hear. She makes a move as if to finish the work, and then turns and looks at the loaf of bread outside the bread box, and in that voice of coming back to familiar things. I wonder how they're finding things upstairs. I hope she had a little more red up up there. You know, it seemed kind of sneaking, locking her up in town and coming out here and trying to get her own house to turn against her. But Mrs. Hale, the law is the law. Huh? Suppose it is. B better loosen up your things, Mrs. Peters. You won't feel them when you go out. Mrs. Peters takes off her fur tippet, goes to hang it on the hook at the back of the room. She stands looking at the under part of a small corner table. She, she was piecing a quilt. Mrs. Peters brings the large sewing basket and they look at the bright pieces. It's a log cabin pattern. Pretty, isn't it? I wonder if she was going to quilt it or just nod it. Footsteps have been heard coming down the stairs. The sheriff enters, followed by Hale and the county attorney. Oh, oh they, they wonder if she was going to quilt it or, uh, or just nod it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <clears throat> Frank's fire didn't do much up there, did it? No. Nah. Well, let's go out to the barn and get that cleared up. The men go outside. I don't know if there's anything so strange or taking up our time with little things while we're waiting for them to get the evidence. I don't see as it's anything to laugh about. Of course, they've got awful important things on their minds. Mrs. Peters pulls up a chair and joins Mrs. Hale at the table. Mrs. Hale examines a block of the quilt. Mrs. Peters, look at this one. Here, here, this is the one she was working on. And look at the sewing. All of the rest of it has been so nice and even. And, and look at this. It's, it's all over the place. Well, it looks as if she didn't even know what she was about. They look at each other. They look at the door. After an instant, Mrs. Hale has pulled in a knot and ripped the sewing. Oh, what are you doing, Mrs. Hale? Oh. Just pulling out a stitch or two that's not sewed very good. Bad sewing always makes me fidgety. I don't think we ought to touch things. Well, I'll just finish up this end. Mrs. Peters. Yes, Mrs. Hale? 
What do you suppose she was so nervous about? Oh, I don't know. I don't know what she was nervous. I sometimes so awful queer when I'm just tired. Well, I must get these things wrapped up. They may be done sooner than we think. Wonder where I can find a piece of paper and some string. In that cupboard, maybe. Mrs. Peters looks in the cupboard. Oh, why, here's a bird cage. She holds it up. Bird? Did she have a bird, Mrs. Hale? Well, I don't know whether she did or not. I'm not been out here for so long, but there was a man around last year selling canaries cheap. But I don't know if she took one. Maybe she did. She used to sing real pretty herself. Seems funny to think of a bird here. But she must have had one, or why else would she have a cage? I wonder what happened to it. Well, I suppose maybe the cat got it. No, she didn't have a cat. She's got that feeling some people have about cats, being afraid of them. My cat got in her room and she was real upset and asked me to take it out. My sister Bessie was like that. Queer, ain't it? Mrs. Peters examines the cage. Why look at this door. It's broke and one hinge is pulled apart. It looks as if someone must have been rough with it. Why, yes. She brings the cage forward and puts it on the table. I, I wish if they were going to find any evidence, they'd be about it. I don't like this place. But I'm awful glad you came with me, Mrs. Hale. It would be awful lonesome for me sitting here all alone. It would, wouldn't it? But I'll tell you what I do wish, Mrs. Peters. I, I wish I had come over here sometime when she was here. I, I wish I had. But of course you were awful busy, Mrs. Hale. Your house and your children. I could have come. I stayed away because it weren't cheerful. And that's why I ought to have come. I, I've never liked this place. Maybe because it's down in the hollow and you don't see the road. I, I don't know what it is, but it's a lonesome place and it always was. I wish I had come over to see Minnie Foster sometimes, but well, I can see... Reproach. You mustn't reproach yourself, Mrs. Hale. Sometimes we just don't see how it is with other folks until something comes up. Not having children makes less work, but it, it makes a quiet house. And right out to work all day and no company when he did come in. Did you know John Wright, Mrs. Peters? Not to know him. I've seen him in town. They say he was a good man. Yes, good. Uh, he didn't drink, and he kept his words as well as most, I guess, and he paid his debts, but he was a hard man, Mrs. Peters. Just to pass the time of day with him, ugh, like a raw wind that gets to the bone. Her eyes fall on the cage. I should think she would have wanted a bird. But what do you suppose went with it? I don't know. Unless it got sick and died. Mrs. Peters reaches over and swings the broken door. Swings it again. Both women watch it. You weren't raised round here, were you? You didn't know her. Not till they brought her yesterday. Well, she... I'll come to think of it. She was kind of like a bird herself. Real sweet and pretty, but kind of timid and, and fluttery. How she did change. Silence. And in a matter of returning to familiar things. Tell you what, Mrs. Peters, why don't you take the quilt in with you? It will take up her mind. Well, I think that's a real nice idea, Mrs. Hale. There couldn't possibly be any objection to it, could there? Now, just what would I take? I wonder if her patches are in here and her things. They look in the sewing basket. Well, here's some red. I expect this has got sewing things in it. She brings out a fancy box. Oh, what a pretty box. Looks like something somebody would give you. Maybe her scissors are in here. She opens the box. What? 
Well, there's something wrapped up in this piece of silk. Oh, why, this is in her scissors? Oh, Mrs. Peters. It, it's... It's the bird. But Mrs. Peters, just look at it. Its neck. Look at its neck. It, it, it's all other side, too. Somebody, somebody wrong its neck. Their eyes meet. A look of growing comprehension of horror. Steps are heard outside. Mrs. Hale slips the box under the quilt pieces and sinks into her chair. The sheriff enters and the county attorney. Mrs. Peters rises. Well, ladies, have you decided whether she was going to quilt it or knot it? I think she was going to knot it. Well, that's interesting, I'm sure. He sees the birdcage. Has the bird flown? Mrs. Hale places more quilt pieces over the box. We think the cat got it. Oh, is there a cat? The women's eyes meet for an instant. Well, not now. They're superstitious, you know? They leave. No sign at all of anyone having come from the outside. Their own rope. Now, let's go up again and go over it piece by piece. The men start upstairs. It would have to have been someone who knew Jack. Mrs. Peters sits down. The two women sit there, not looking at one another, but as if peering into something and at the same time holding back. When they talk now, it is the manner of feeling their way over strange ground, as if afraid of what they are saying, and yet they are unable to not say it. She liked the bird. She was going to bury it in that pretty box. I was a girl. My kitten. There was a boy. Took a hatchet. And before my eyes. Before I could get there. If he held me back, I would have hurt him. I wonder how it would seem never to have had children around. No, Wright wouldn't like the bird, a thing that sang. She used to sing. He killed that, too. We don't know who killed the bird. Mm, I knew John Wright. It was an awful thing that was done that night, Mrs. Hale. Killing a man while he slept, slipping a rope around his neck that choked the life out of him. Yeah. His neck choked the life out of him. Her hand goes out and rests on the birdcage. We don't know who killed him. We don't know. If there'd been years and years of nothing, and then a bird to sing to you, well, it would be awful. Still, after the bird was still. I know what stillness is. When we homesteaded in Dakota and my first baby died after he was just two years old and me with no other than Mr. Peters breathing how, how, how soon do you suppose they'll be through looking for the evidence? I know what stillness is. The law has got to punish crime, Mrs. Hale. I wish you would seen Minnie Foster when she wore a white dress with blue ribbons and she stood up there in the choir and sang. Oh, I wish I'd come over here once in a while. That was a crime. Now that was a crime. Who's going to punish that? Mustn't take on. Well, I might have known that she needed help. I know how things can be for women. I'll tell you, it's queer, Mrs. Peters. We all live close together and we live far apart. We all go through the same things. It's all just a different kind of the same thing. Just a different kind of the same thing. If I was you, I wouldn't tell her her fruit was gone. I would tell her it ain't. T tell her it's all right. Take this in to prove it to her. She, 
She may never know whether it was broke or not. Mrs. Peters takes the bottle, looks about for something to wrap it in. She takes a petticoat from the clothes that they brought from the other room, and she very nervously begins winding this around the bottle. My, it's a good thing the men couldn't hear us when they laugh, getting all stirred up over a little thing like a dead canary, as if that could have anything to do with, wouldn't they just laugh? The men are heard coming down the stairs. Uh, maybe they would. Maybe they wouldn't. No, Peters, it's all perfectly clear except a reason for doing it. Ah, but you know juries when it comes to women. If there was some definite thing, something to show, something to make a story about, a thing that would connect up with this strange way of doing it. The women's eyes meet for an instant. Hale enters from the outer door. Well, I got the team around. It's pretty cold out there. I'm going to stay here for a while by myself. You can send Frank out for me, can't you? I want to go over everything. I'm not satisfied that we can't do better. Hmm. Do you uh, do you want to see what Mrs. Peters is, uh, is going to take in? The attorney goes to the table, picks up the apron. Oh, I guess they're not very dangerous things the ladies have picked out. He moves a few things about, disturbing the quilt pieces which cover the box. No, Mrs. Peters doesn't need supervising. For that matter, a sheriff's wife is married to the law. <laughs> Ever think of it that way, Mrs. Peters? Not just that way. <laughs> married to the law. <laughs> Good. Oh, I just want you to, did you come in here, George? Uh, you know, we ought to take a look at these windows. Oh, windows. Yeah. Uh, we'll be right out, Mr. Hale. Hale goes outside. The sheriff follows the county attorney into the other room. Then Mrs. Hale rises, hands tight together, looking intensely at Mrs. Peters, whose eyes make a slow turn, finally meeting Mrs. Hale's. A moment, Mrs. Hale holds her, and then her own eyes, they point to where the box is concealed. Suddenly, Mrs. Peters throws back quilt pieces and tries to put the box in the bag she is wearing. It is too big. She opens the box, starts to take the bird out, but cannot touch it, and goes to pieces. Steps are heard from the other room. Quickly, Mrs. Hale snatches the box and puts it in the pocket of her big coat. The county attorney and the sheriff enter. Well, Henry, at least we found out that she was not going to quilt it. She was going to, what is it you call it, ladies? We call it... Not it, Mr. Henderson. When I was young 